All right. Glad to see everybody who can make it today. And hello to everybody that will be listening later on the uh, videos that we put up. And um, they can always check out any of our talks at cognj.org. And uh, correct? Yep. And, they, we put, and they're also on YouTube now. They're basically on YouTube. But you can get them through the website. So today, <clears throat> I want to do something a little different than I normally do. It's not going to be so much of a sermon, but a little bit of a discussion and talk on it. I'm going to touch on the historical aspects of the temple. And um, going back to, to the time of Abraham and then moving forward. And um, it's, put it this way, you really, it, it, it would be hard to do a comprehensive talk on anything. The Bible is such a vast, uh, uh, you know, wealth of knowledge and understanding in there to do a comprehensive talk on any topic in the scriptures is impossible. So this is not a comprehensive talk. It's a little skip through the timeline and the history of the temple and um, to bring us to our present times because in our present time and we'll touch on this at the very end over there we know that that temple has been gone now for it's going to be I think it's approaching 2,000 years that the temple is gone that is coming up I, I, I forget the date but it's it's, it's very soon it's very soon hmm? 27 20, within the next 27 years. Okay, no, in uh, 70, 2070, it'll be 2000. In 2070. Destroyed in 70. Right, 70 AD. So that's coming up. It's coming up quick in the lifetime of at least our children, if not us. <laughs> you know? So we don't know how long we're going to be around. But um, anyway, to start with, we're going to do, and like the dates I'm going to give you are, they're rough dates because getting a strict dates and timelines is very difficult and there's a lot of debate about that, about the specific dates, but all we're trying to do is just get a general idea of about when these things happen, okay? We're not looking for, to nail down the day, the month, and the, and the year, okay? So just keep that in mind, that it's, it's, it's not meant to be that. They're, they're, they're pretty much generalized. So, to start with, it's believed, and we can see some evidence of this through the scripture, that Abraham had journeyed three days. And he came to Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. And that's where he offered his son Isaac on the altar, as Yah had um, commanded him. And I'll make a break here real quick. If you hear me use the words Yah or Yeshua or something like that, those are the, for people who are new that are listening in, those are the Hebrew names for uh, God and for Jesus. So just so they can keep up with us and what we're talking about. So, and anyway, we can see this account mentioned about going up to uh, Mount Moriah in, in Genesis 22, in Hebrews 11, and in Second Chronicles. Okay, so Mount Moriah is the site that, well, at least what we know from Scripture is became the Temple Mount over there. Now I know there's always difference of opinions out there, but generally that's accepted. Um, by most people through the scripture. So, and that, this event, most people dated around 2000 or so BC, approximately. So, it's very interesting that the first sacrifice that took place on the Temple Mount was about 2000, approximately BC, and we're coming up about 2,000 years from the last time a godly sacrifice was, took place on that Temple Mount, when, before that temple was destroyed. So we're coming up on a 2,000 year period after that. So that's just an interesting little 
uh, note. Now, somewhere around 1000 BC, 1000 BC, now we know in between that time the Ark of the Covenant was established and the children of Israel and they came out of Egypt. So now we're up to the time of David. So David moves the Ark to Jerusalem and places it and places the tabernacle in on the Mount Moriah over there. And David plans the first temple to be built to house it aside from the tabernacle that it already existed in. <clears throat> but as we know, Yah did not allow him to build it. And you can see that in 2 Samuel 7 and also in 2 Samuel 6 when he, when he moved it in 1 Chronicles 15. So like I said, that's around 1000 BC. Now around, somewhere around, uh, like I said, these are very generalized dates. So they're, they're not precise. So somewhere around, you know, 950 or so, Solomon. Solomon begins to build the temple that his father David had planned. And he got that help from Hiram of Tyre. And they used, um, if I have it correctly here, 183,600 workers to build this temple. And we know that when he traded, when Solomon traded with Hiram to, of Tyre to build the temple, the commodities of trade that they used at that time, it was uh, oil, uh, wine, wheat, and barley. And those are the four things mentioned. Remember the, the four horsemen? Of, uh, they call it the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Those are the four items of trade that are mentioned by that third horseman that holds the balances. And balances, often they could mean judgment, but they also refer to trade. And those are the exact items that Hiram and Solomon traded in were those four items that are mentioned in the Horsemen of the Apocalypse. That's just a little side note over there. And it's also interesting that the only time we really see the number 666 come up is associated with Solomon for the time, because I believe it was, and somebody could help me out with this, it was 666 talents of um, gold, was it? Does anybody remember? I think it was gold that he would receive, right, from, um, I can't remember which king it was. But, uh, yeah, that's the only place where the six, besides Revelation, where 666 is mentioned. There is one other place, I think, in Numbers, when it's numbering the tribes. It, I, I believe it comes up again. But, um, but that's just another interesting little side note. Um, so let's see. And so next, around 910 BC or so, around that time, uh, the Pharaoh from Egypt, Egypt was under siege by, I mean, Jerusalem was under siege by Egypt, and they plundered then the temple treasury at that time, and it was about 910 BC. And they took much of the gold and the silver out of the temple. And that you can see in 1 Kings 14 and 2 Chronicles 12. You can get an account of that. Now, as we move along, we're getting a little closer. Now at 835 BC, at this time, Josiah repairs the temple and brings a period of revival and reform for, for Judah, okay? Because by that time, the kingdoms had already split. So, and in 2 Kings 12, we see that he had to pay Hazel, the king of Syria, tribute from the royal and the temple treasury. So again, the temple treasury was raided again for a second time. And like I said, that account is, uh, I believe, is mentioned in 2 Kings. 
um, 12. Now, moving on to 732 BC, 732 BC, and this is the gold of the temple, again was given to uh, Tilgath Pileser III, who was the king of Assyria at the time, and it was tribute, it was, it was payment for him saving uh, them from the Syrian attack. And so he allied himself with Israel, and then they had to pay tribute for that service. And it reminds me of when, when, when Yah is lamenting about Israel and how they're, they're turning from him. He, he says it as, a, as like a broken-hearted lover. You know, he says, you know, I, I give you everything, and instead of turning to me, you go to your lover's. And then they use you, and then they throw you away. You go to Egypt, you go to Assyria, you go to Greece, you go to Rome, instead of coming to me, instead of coming to me. So that always reminds me that when I read about how Israel keeps making these alliances, and he said, don't make those alliances. Come to me. I'll be your refuge. I'll be your strong fort, you know. But Israel was stubborn. He called them stiff-necked, a stiff-necked people. And they continue to go to their worldly lovers instead of going to their husband, Yah, spiritual husband. So, let's see. Uh, so also, uh, Tilgath Pileser, he also uh, caused the Solomon's bronze laver to be dismantled. And I'm sorry, not him. Uh, King Ahaz, I meant to say, uh, to be dismantled. And um, he replaced it with a replica of a Syrian altar. Amazing, right? How, how far do they continue to stray from, from Yah and his way? And that, those accounts you can see in 2 Kings 16 and 2 Chronicles 28. And then, around... 715 BC, we see Hezekiah. Now, Hezekiah, he restores the temple and he brings a period of reform, okay, to Judah. And, but he also takes the silver from the temple treasury and he strips the gold from the temple doors, right? And he pays tribute to Sennacherib, the king of Assyria. So even Hezekiah, you know, instead of going to Yah for the protection, he tries to pay off with tribute. And um, so those accounts you can find in Second Chronicles 29 and Second Kings 18. So, where does that bring us? That brings us uh, to 587. BC, 587 BC. Now we're all familiar with that period of time because that's the time that Nebuchadnezzar comes on the scene, right? Right around that time. And he lays siege to Jerusalem. He burns the city, murders many of the inhabitants, and he carries many of them away captive. And the temple is destroyed and the sacred vessels are carried off into Babylon where they sat for 70 years, correct? Yeah, 70 years. And um, until the time, uh, let's see, they were desecrated by Belshazzar, which some people say was his grandson. I don't know. But um, so, and you can find the, some accounts of this in uh, 2 Kings 24, 2 Chronicles 36, in the writings of Josephus, and also in um, Daniel 5, all right? So you can get some of those accounts of that. So, now Judah, the southern kingdom, they're in captivity for the uh, 70 years or so, and now we're around 541, around 541 B.C., Cyrus, right? He's the king of Persia. He's the one who lets allows the Jews to start to return, Judah to start to return back to 
um, in small numbers back to Jerusalem and start to rebuild the walls. So now the, the actual building of the temple, as we know, it did get delayed. Uh, there was a lot of opposition uh, from the surrounding peoples that didn't want it built, and um, so it was delayed. But finally, after 15 years of delay, it was rebuilt, and that was at around 515 or so B.C. And you can find some of the account of that in Daniel 9 and in Haggai 2. So, moving on now, we're skipping ahead in time all the way to a period of time from about 150, 175 B.C. to about 163 or so B.C., somewhere around there, where an interesting character comes on the scene by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes IV, right? And many people see him as the little horn of Daniel, Daniel 8. And we know what he did, that he plunders Jerusalem. He murders many of the inhabitants there. He did some awful things that I'm not going to repeat at the moment during, the, during that time. He desecrates also the temple, and he offers a pig on the altar, and he carries away many of the treasures from the temple. And so temple worship is halted, you know, right around the time of... Um, during that period. So, I, and now that leads us into during that period from 170 on, you have the period of the Maccabees, and we're all familiar with that story that comes onto the scene. How uh, they resist the Greek occupation and they take the temple back over and they rededicate it, and we all know that's where we get the Festival of Lights or Hanukkah from. And um, so that, and, the, and then the, the sacrifices are restored somewhere around 165 B.C. So now this account, as you know, is not necessarily in the scriptures, but it is in the book of Maccabees, okay? So in the apocryphal writings. But um, it is not. So we know it from history and from the Maccabees that these things happen. Now, fast forwarding a little bit to around 63 B.C., when something else happens, the Romans, they conquer this territory, including Judah, including Judah. How did the Romans wind up there? They wound up there because they wanted someone to help. They were having an inner squabble. Judah was having an inner squabble about who was going to be the leader, and one guy teamed up with the Greeks, and the other guy want, uh, called the Romans to help him. So they actually invited the Romans in, <laughs> you know? The Romans didn't initially want to take over that area, but they were invited in. And then Pompey the Great, he was a great Roman general. He conquers, he sets, a, um, he sets the government in order with, um, I can't remember uh, which leader it was that supported or that asked Pompey to come in, but he sets him up as the leader over there. And then he does something, Pompey. He walks into the temple and he sees the curtain. What's hiding behind the curtain? He walks in, he opens it up, there's nothing in there. So he closes it, turns around, and he says, continue on. You guys worship as you always did before, you know. And the Romans pretty much leave them alone for many years, you know, for many years. So, now we get into the time of about 40 B.C. 40 B.C., Herod the Great comes on the scene. And we know that he was a pretty tough character. He was the one who slayed Rachel's, uh, as it talks in the scriptures, Rachel's children mourning in Bethlehem when he went after uh, the newborn uh, Messiah. And um, so, and but now, but Herod also did a lot of building projects <clears throat> in Jerusalem and in the surrounding areas of Judah. And one of the things he did 
was he greatly enlarged the Temple Mount. He made it a bigger mountain. He leveled it out and he made it bigger. And then he built the second temple, a greater temple than one that was there before. And um, a matter of fact, I think, let me see, Temple Court rebuilt. I'm, I'm pretty sure that at the time of Christ, that temple was still not completed. It was still being worked on from that time that uh, Herod the Great had started. I mean, it was intact. You were able to use it, but there was still construction going on at that time. And so this is around 40 B.C. or so when Herod uh, started that, or at least when he had the idea to do it. So when we know at the time of Christ, and Christ died somewhere around 30 A.D., uh, AD, you know what I mean, um, depending on who you talk to. So that, that temple took a long time to finally be completed. As a matter of fact, and I, my memory could be wrong, but I think it was, wasn't totally completed until just about like 25 years or so before it was destroyed. <laughs> you know, so by the time they had it all put together, it was already gone <laughs> in one generation later. So... It's amazing. So, let's see. So after this time, now we're going to fast forward. So I'm trying to hit all the high points of things that had happened on Mount Moriah, or Mount Zion, and to the temple. Okay? So now we're up to the point of 70 B.C. Uh, I'm sorry, A.D. 70 A.D. And we all know what happened at that time. We know that the Roman general, Titus, took over the siege of Jerusalem that his father Vespasian had started. Now Vespasian had got called back to Rome because he was made emperor by the troops. Because there was, that was a tumultuous time in Rome. They, they called it the year of the four emperors because they kept going through them like every two months or so or whatever it was they were uh, you know they were killing one and putting another one in so Vespasian comes in and then he sort of levels everything out but he leaves his son Titus who would be the future emperor in charge of the siege of Jerusalem so we we get this account mainly from Josephus and some other writings out there, and they're from the Roman writings themselves and also from Josephus. So, during this time, there's a fierce battle on the Temple Mount. Um, they resist all the way into the outer courts of the Temple. Um, by the time they, uh, the Romans break through into the Temple grounds themselves, the Temple's already on fire. And there were, were like, the way I understand it, there was a fire war going on. The uh, zealots lit fires to try to stop the Romans from going in, so the Romans sent fire over onto them, and then the whole place was in pretty much starting to get engulfed with flames. And while it was burning, they, I believe Vespasian walked in, sort of like Pompey did, to see what's in here. And actually, the reports are, at least according to Josephus, that Titus tried to put out the fire because he wanted it originally preserved, but it was too far gone. So he also walks in and sees nothing in there, and then basically the, uh, we know the result. We know what happened. At that time, the temple was destroyed as Christ had predicted. He prophesied it ahead of time that not one stone is going to be left on top of the other here. And that's what happened, just as he said it. That was one of his, because his, nobody could believe that that would happen. So that was a very prominent prophecy that, that he had given. Because it was unthinkable that something like that would happen to the temple. And it's remained that way now for almost 2,000 years. Almost 2,000 years. So, there was something else that um, Titus did. 
before they sieged the temple itself, outside the gate of the temple, the Romans would typically um, do a sacrifice before a siege. So they did. They did their sacrifice. Now, some people believe that was the abomination of desolation because they say he sacrificed uh, pagan worship in the temple. But if you read, the, the only account that we have it from it is in Josephus. And if you read it correctly, it was, the, that sacrifice was not done in the temple. It was on the gate opposite the temple. So it was outside the temple grounds that that sacrifice was done. So um, that's because uh, the word over against doesn't mean within. It means you're facing it on, and you're on the outside of it. But um, so that's that was the the point, the point that was central to Christ's prophecy over there of not one stone being on top of another, that whole temple being destroyed. And they brought that up at his trial, too. If you remember that, that this man said that he's going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. You know what I mean? And obviously they under, misunderstood what he was talking about. So anyway, to continue on, we're going to continue on now. And the temple is gone, but Mount Moriah, Mount Zion, it's still there. It's still there. So what, what becomes of it? Well, in around 136, the emperor Hadrian, he erects a temple of Jupiter on the mount. And he puts a statue of himself there facing east towards the Mount of Olives, right? Because the way the uh, Temple Mount is situated, directly to the east is the Mount of Olives. So behind the temple was the west. To the left of the temple was north, and south was to the right of the temple. If you were standing in the temple itself, it would be to the right, it would be south. So. He puts this image up facing the Mount of Olives. And um, now, there was a, a time period right around, and also he renamed um, Jerusalem at that time. I think it was Alea Capolatina or something like that. He, he renamed it, actually. He gave it a different name. And when he did that, it actually... That's one of the things that provoked, has anybody heard of the uh, Bar Kokhba re rebellion? That's one of the things that helped spark that rebellion in about 135 or so um, AD. So now there was an attempt to build a third temple sometime after that during the Bar Kokhba revolt, but it, obviously it, it failed, it didn't go anywhere. So. Fast forward now to around 330 A.D., all right, up to around that time and after, 330 A.D. and after. This is the time of Constantine, right, Constantine the Great. Now, he made Christianity an official religion of Rome, or at least his version of Christianity, to set the record straight. Uh, for the uh, Roman Empire. And between him and his mother, they picked out locations and they built uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and a couple other uh, locations. Uh, apparently, they claimed that they found the place of the crucifixion and they found a piece of the cross and, and a bunch of other things like that that are very questionable. So, after that, sometime later, um, I think it was around 60, 614, 614 BC, the Persians come in and they conquest that area. So the Persians come in, they exile the Christians, and they later they banish the Jews from there also. <clears throat> now, the emperor Hadrian, he recaptures Jerusalem at that time. But since that time on, it becomes nothing but, some people say a garbage heap. 
you know, after all the destruction and the war that went on, it wasn't maintained, and it, it, it just fell into total disrepair. <clears throat> you know, whatever Roman temple was there at the time. So, they could, some people say it became like a refugee. People would just dump stuff over there at the time. So, the Emperor Herodias proposed building a new temple near there. But I don't think that ever took place. From what I can tell, uh, I think, uh, where was it? I think it was around 685 BC. Somewhere around 685 BC, the Islam, Muslims, had conquered much of that area and that territory. And they cleared, the tradi Islamic tradition says at least, that they cleared the rubber off the Temple Mount. And... A.D. Uh, A.D. Yeah, okay. yeah. They cleared all the rubbish off the Temple Mount. And they started doing prayers there. Sometime, uh, I mean, the prayers started somewhere around 638 A.D. or so. And then they, eventually they built the El Ask Mosque. And that was around 700 A.D. And then, lay, and then also, now not only that, they built the Dome of the Rock, you know, the famous Dome of the Rock with the, the shining um, uh, roof on it that sits there now. And that was constructed somewhere around 690 or so A.D. So now we have the Temple Mount where Abraham was with Isaac, where David proposed the temple to God, where Solomon built the temple of God, where Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple of God, where it was rebuilt in Hezekiah's day, and then when it was expanded under Herod, and then destroyed again by the Romans. Now you find it in the hands of Islam. So, moving forward, it didn't stay in the hands of Islam. Somewhere around 1099 to 1180 AD, we know we had the Crusades going on at that time. So the Crusaders, they did briefly conquer the Holy Land, and they renamed it for Christianity, and they reconsecrated the Dome of the Rock as the Temple Salomonis, all right? in honor of, I believe it was in honor of Solomon. So they rededicated that Islamic mosque for Christianity, so to speak. But then, around 1187 AD, Saladin comes in and he kicks out the Crusaders and he rededicates and restores the al Mosque and the Dome of the Rock. And all the Christian icons are removed out of there because they had, they had made them churches, basically. So they move them all out of there. Fast forward now to 1917 AD. 1917, and we all know what happened around that time. The British captured Jerusalem from the Turks, right? From the Ottoman Empire. And that's the first time now since the Crusaders held it that the Temple Mount was open to non-Muslims to be able to get up there again. Now, fast forward, 1948. We all know what happens, the rebirth of the modern state of Israel. And we know that temporarily, in 1967, Israel actually captured briefly the Temple Mount and flew the flag of Israel over the Temple Mount but then turned over control, or stewardship at least, to the Muslims again. So, as it remains to this day. And that's the period that we're at with uh, Temple Mount. It is in the hands of Islam. It remains that way, but, but, 1982. In 1982, there was a union of the three temple groups. And that's the, uh, those groups were the faithful of the Temple Mount, to the Mountain of the Lord, and the Jerusalem Temple Foundation. And they started planning 
a third temple to be built over there. And that's the state what we're in at the moment. We know that some of these groups have already reconstituted a, a priesthood and reconstituted a Sanhedrin. And I do say a priesthood and a Sanhedrin. I don't know how accurate they are in the, putting these things together, but we'll see. They've also constructed all the temple implements they've created. And the, as far as I know, the last time they were all... Um, does anybody know where they're sitting right now? I forgot. I think they were in Shiloh. I think they're all sitting up in Shiloh. All the temple implements, everything they need, the brass, um, uh, the, the horns, the uh, altars, the implements for the sacrifices, they're all made sitting ready to go. They have their priesthood, uh, or that they claim is, is all, they have their own, yeah, they, they claim they have the Levitical priesthood all set up. They, they train them to do sacrifices. Um, and they're waiting. They're waiting for an opportunity to implement a third temple because there were two that were totally destroyed. So this would be the third one. There were some other destructions of the temple, but two complete destructions, and this would be a third, uh, this will be a third rebuilding of a totally destructed uh, temple. So, this is the point where we are now. And this is the point where Maybe you can give me a little feedback from just your thoughts on, since we're at this point now, what do you think about it? Do you think that they're going to succeed or that they're not going to succeed in doing it? Anybody have a word that they might want to well, say on it? I believe that the temple is going to be rebuilt because... <clears throat> Ezekiel's prophecy mm -hmm. has to be fulfilled. Okay. That would be pointing to a third attempt to rebuild on the Temple Mount. Okay. Anybody else have a thought or a comment on that? So is this, you, you believe because of the, let me re restate that a little bit, because of the Ezekiel talks about because the, Ezekiel's prophecies right, are, prophecies that, the future prophecy of the right. Future. So you, you believe that that's, yes. It should be rebuilt then by someone at least, right? Okay. Uh, anybody else have a thought, a comment on them? Well, the Orthodox yeah. want to build that temple. Uh, I'm sorry, the Orthodox, the Orthodox Jews. Jews. Okay. But like Messianic <clears throat> Jewish people, uh, they think if that temple is built, that's going to be...